Hey, everybody. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone to the Black Present, History in the Making, a series presented by the Black Foxes to highlight remarkable Black individuals who are making their own history in the present. As the Black Foxes, and as most of you know, our sole mission is to create our own narratives. So instead of talking about the past this year, we're going to express our gratitude for the present. And I am your host. My name is Marty. And today I am joined by Evan Green, the illustrious. How are you today, Evan? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Oh man, thank you so much for coming on. This is this is this is great. Finally get a chance to we get a chance to sit down for a virtual coffee and have a chit chat. So um Evan, do me a favor. Tell us who you are. Um, where you're from, age, all the all the basic information, and 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 basically what it is you do. We'll kick it off from there. Yeah, I'm Evan Green. I am 33 years old. I'm based in Albuquerque. I was born in Queens and grew up in Texas, and uh, kind of has been in the Mountain West in Colorado and New Mexico now for the past six years. And I'm a freelance photographer and filmmaker. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Got you. And um, that's, that's amazing. So you're from Queens originally, huh? Yeah. Yep. I was born there and moved when I was two years old. So I don't have a lot of memories, but that's where my dad's from and stuff. And my, his whole side of the family is back there in Queens. So it's kind of where our roots are in Jamaica, Queens. In Jamaica, Queens. And let me ask you this: Do you know about your grandparents? And just out of curiosity, we're we're, we're in Black History Month, and I'm I'm curious because I have this really interesting book I'll talk about. It's called The Warmth of Other Suns. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I think I have it in the house, and my girlfriend read it, but I haven't personally read it. So, um, yeah, my my uh, my sister let me borrow it, but nice. um, yeah, I was going to ask you because I want to know if you knew where your grandparents and great grandparents, what part I'm imagining from the south, where they where they came from. Yeah. Um, if you don't, it's fine. But I don't fully know the whole story, but I actually just contacted my uh, aunt who's in her 90s, so she knows a lot of the family history and stuff, and so she emailed me some letters and stuff like that, and she had a little bit of the family history and. Um, kind of how they had moved around from Jamaica and Cuba and then eventually came to the U.S. and things like that. Um, so that's kind of my that dad's side of the family. And my mom's side of the family is from California. And I don't know as much, so I got to pick my grandma's brain and get all the family history before, you know, it goes. <laughs> way. Yeah, man. Yeah, sorry. I guess I was assuming, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess that was a wrong assumption on my part because I never asked about your dad. But so your dad, your, your dad's side of the family is from Cuba. Um, yeah, Cuba and Jamaica. I think they were originally Jamaica, Jamaica, yeah, yeah. into Cuba and then kind of like it had you ever going back and forth. I don't know the whole stories of why they were kind of moving around at points, but um, yeah, kind of in the Caribbean there and then came to the US. So, okay, okay. And um, and you said you went from New York to, to Texas and you've basically spent most of your life in the south, southwest. Um, yeah, for the most part, except for my family's all in Ohio now in Cleveland. I went to college up there. And so, yeah, kind of <laughs> every part of the U.S. is covered almost here. But yeah, so I got used to the cold in winter and that's where I learned to snowboard was in Cleveland. You learned to snowboard in the Midwest, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I worked at the ski resort after classes in college. So I was just a lifty making like $7 an hour. Um, but you got a free season pass, so I would just go out there and ride my snowboard around, and that's where I developed most of my skills snowboarding. Really? I didn't even know that Ohio had hills like that. <laughs> yep, there's like 400 feet of vertical. That's <laughs> all so there was at the snow resort, but yeah, it's just a valley ca carved out by the Cuyahoga River, so it's kind of just a big river valley that had enough relief that they get enough snow up there that you can ski. So. Okay, just enough, right? It's like right at the threshold of like yeah. being able to see or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, I'm curious, um, we, you and I, we we had our first, uh, We well, we had kind of like, we were Insta friends before, but we, have, we officially got to meet back in October at the, uh, at our 
Black Fox's first uh, reunion where we actually all got a chance to be in the same physical space at the same time. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that was awesome. It was great to meet you. That was good, man. That was really good. And uh, wow, all the pictures, I've seen all your pictures from that experience all over the in, all over the gram, all over everywhere. Uh, that was a, a that was a great experience, uh, at least for me personally, meeting all you guys and just being in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, so, how did you get into? Uh, so, I'm I'm just I'm curious about just you. Like, how, how did you get into photography? And you can go one by one, but I'm just interested in your 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 history, like how you got into photography and how you got to be so awesome at it, um, and how you how, how did. Evan pre outdoors to Evan now. That's kind of where the span of things I want to to talk about today. But let's start with photography. How'd you how'd you get into it? Um, I would say I really just when I got the iPhone that had the camera on it. <laughs> that's when it really took <laughs> off for me. I mean, I had like those disposable cameras growing up and like a digital camera, but you know, I used it like once or twice a year, like a lot of people. Um, but then when I had that, like, um camera phone kind of right right there in your pocket i just was that person yeah. always taking photos of everything and like every like if we went on like a camping trip i just like document everything and take photos of everything and so i guess just over time you know you're kind of there's different periods in your like progression and there's kind of like the quantity period so i definitely just like would take like hundreds of photos of everything and then mm -hmm. kind of like that helps you improve your quality over time and just get experience and know what you're looking for. So I would mm -hmm. say that helped. And then eventually I kind of like started to reach the limits of the iPhone and kind of wanted more. So that's when I bought my first interchangeable lens camera. Um, so you can swap out the lenses and it was like a digital camera. It was the Sony A3000. So that was probably four years ago now. Um, okay, and, okay. You know, no idea of like about Sony or Canon and like the mirrorless stuff. It was just like a hundred bucks on Amazon, so I bought it. Um, of it course, board and it turned out it was awesome, and I still have that camera and use it today. So that's awesome. So you're using the same camera? Um, I don't use that one all the time because it's a little slower and clunkier, but it still it works fine. And the photos, I mean, someone just ordered a three foot print from it the other day and it looks great. So I think a lot of people get caught up in the like, gear and it's really about kind of the skill and um, just what you're looking for in the environment sometimes. Right, right. And it's crazy because it's almost like what you're telling me here, it's making me think about how, you know, when we get into something, cycling or hiking or, or any type of hobby right um in any type of like serious way you know it's almost like we have to go through these like certain rites of passages by you know in your example having like this <clears throat> starting with an iphone right like just you had an iphone and like the the interest the 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 love like caught you and captured you and you're like oh man i want more but then your first camera, right? You don't know all the stuff. You don't know like what's cool or whatever in the <laughs> camera world. You you just want to take pictures. You know, you just want to have fun. So you got the Sony, you got this uh, piece of equipment. I mean, not the best, but it serves its purpose. So, I mean, in a way it kind of is the best, right? Because what have you really been able to handle a 5D or something like that back when you got your, when you first got a camera? Yeah, no, that's something that I really try to like appreciate and preach and stuff. And then you see, um, yeah, it's almost hard because sometimes people do have like a little more financial means or something, and but they're new and you're like, hey, just start off with this basic thing. And they're like, no, I need the best, you know? And it's kind of hard to like, show people that it's not really, you know, when you're getting started, like you don't need that carbon bike with like the newest group set and like the, you know, stuff. You're not like a pro racer. You're like, you just got to get it get your fitness up and get into cycling and learn how to handle the bike and that stuff's gonna be a lot more important than your like you know two thousand dollar wheel set that you think is going to help improve your riding a lot so oh god yeah it's so crazy it's just it's just a it's a pattern that we see not just like with stuff but we it's kind of a bigger thing right evan like we think that the bike or the camera or the equipment or or anything that is external of ourselves right has to be oh we need to have this external thing to either attain happiness order 
calm, skills, whatever. And it's actually the exact opposite. Yeah, I really understand that and like totally agree. Yeah, it's really interesting. You see a lot of people rushing out to buy the latest stuff, but you never see them like kind of pushing to like, hey, maybe I'll take a class on this or like I'll hire an instructor and like spend some one-on-one -on -one time like developing my personal skills. And they just think that the answer is always in a more expensive or a better newest, latest gadget kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, stuff. We need more stuff to be better, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. So for the for the reunion, which camera were you using for that? Or were you using both? Um, no, I just had the Sony a7 III for that just because it does video really well and then you can back up your files. So that was kind of an important shoot. So it, it writes to both cards at one time. So I kind of like that for um, more important things just because you're less likely to lose your data that way. And yeah, and yeah, data is everything in your game. Um, and, and what about, so and you're also kind of, a, you're also uh, quite an outdoorsman. Right. You, how, yeah. how did you tell me about how you went from Queens to like, like how did you and this is for people who, who don't follow Evan. Uh, lots of Evan's work. Most of his work is of the outdoors because that's just where he is all the time. <laughs> so let, let's talk about that. How did how did the transition from Evan pre outdoors come to Evan February 2021? Yeah, um, I guess growing up, I always gravitated to just like hanging out outside and enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I was in Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. My parents enrolled me in that when I was a, a kid in Texas. So uh, I'm actually an Eagle Scout. <laughs> so uh, we would go on like these monthly camping trips. So that was like kind of something I just did like middle school through high school. So um, hmm. yeah, it was like my best friend who lived next door was also in the, the Boy Scout troop with me. So we'd usually just like, hang out and um, go on these trips and stuff like that and do, do the merit badges and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of how I got introduced to the outdoors is going on those camping trips and we go backpacking once or twice a year and things like that. So I was pretty comfortable with it. You know, I got, I was a Boy Scout as well. I lived, I lived in Virginia at the time. Uh, I'm actually from the South as well. I was a Boy Scout, never made it to Eagle Scouts, but so I didn't know how much how much of a difference do we see between the two? Like, do you do actually do more serious like activities? Like, do you learn more? Like, what what do you learn? What do you get out of the Eagle Scouts or learn that you don't get from the Boy Scouts? Uh, well, Eagle Scouts is just the highest rank you can get in Boy Scouts. So um, it was mainly the big community service project at the end and kind of getting back to your community. That was the important part of getting that the Eagle certification. Um, and then you needed a certain number of merit badges and I can't even actually remember all the requirements now. Um, but yeah, I would say honestly, Boy Scouts did help me like get my outdoor skills, but it was also just a bunch of playing like cards at a picnic table. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, 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 that's all part of the, that's all part of it though. You know, yeah, the downtime. Sure. yeah, just kind of like unplugging and stuff and hanging out with the other kids and the, the troop was really fun for me. And what else do you enjoy doing outdoors? What other outdoor activities do you, uh, what, what, what do you really, enjoy, what captures you now? Um, yeah, I got into the snowboarding. We went on one family trip when I was a kid, and then I kind of was always wanting to go more. So then I started working at ski resort. So I'm a big snowboarder. Um, and I do, when I moved to Colorado, I got into backcountry snowboarding and splitboarding. So that kind of took over because it combined like the, yeah, I'm going to ask you, what, what is that? Because, yeah, so some of us, to those who aren't familiar, what is that? Yeah, so splitboarding is essentially a snowboard that lets you uh, go uphill with skins on the bottom, and it splits into two pieces, so it basically turns into skis. So you can, like, walk up mountains or just go wherever you want to in the winter, kind of like snowshoes. Um, and then you can put it back together when you get to the top and then snowboard down. So so they, they pivot on the boots so that they, they can, you can use them like that to walk? Yeah, so, you know. Yeah, so it, it all kind of transforms and lets you walk and lift your heels up, kind of like telly skis, um, so you can walk uphill, and then you get to snowboard down. So, I love it. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you call that again? What kind of snowboarding? Uh, it's splitboarding. So it splits into two pieces, and then you splitboarding. Yep. 
Okay, so so split boarding and, and, and what else are you into? Because I see you on the bike as well. We're, we're going to get to that in a minute, but we'll save yeah. that for last. Um, but, I, like, yeah, I do a lot of uh, rock climbing too. Um, I mainly boulder, but I also have been getting more into sport climbing and tri climbing. So those are kind of like three disciplines within climbing. And and, and yeah. tell us a little bit about those because I am I'm, I'm not Fabia, so I I'm a little <laughs> lost. Yeah, Go through each one really quickly for us. Yeah, uh, bouldering is um, usually just kind of freestanding pieces of rock that are usually, you know, about five to ten feet tall, and so they're usually a lot more technical and just a few moves that you do. And you, if you fall off, you're not on a rope or anything. You just have this big, basically, they call them crash pads, but they're just a big soft mattress kind of thing that you bring with you. So if you fall, you just land on that. Um, so you're really working on like your technical skills in climbing and like these really hard few moves. Um, and then sport climbing is what I think a lot of people would traditionally think of as rock climbing. Um, that's where you put your harness on, you have a partner who's watching you and you have the rope. And so then you're climbing up the wall and you can either, you do what's called top rope where the ropes are, you kind of set up from the top of the cliff or you can uh, attach the rope as you go up with these quick draws into the rock. So yeah, that's really fun too. And then that, if you fall, the rope catches you, obviously. Um, and then usually it's 100 feet or so that you would climb, so it's a lot taller, and you can climb multiple pitches and stuff like that. And so you can go way up and climb a lot of different stuff that way. And then trad climbing is very similar to sport climbing, except for there's no pre bulb What's it called? I'm sorry, what's it called? Trad climbing? Uh, yeah, trad, just traditional climbing. So that was kind of like the original... Uh, form of rope climbing and stuff where they would they used to like uh, hammer in these little nails essentially into the rock but then they invented these camming devices which you can pin the cracks or little features in the rock and then they'll hold themselves into place and so then you can clip your rope into that and it will hold you in case of a fall so really how do they God, how do they I always wonder how they invent these little things that literally have your life <laughs> in their little hooks, you know, like mm -hmm. how do inventions like this come come about, you know? So it's like a little hook and it like just opens in the rock. Like, is it like that? How's it? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's kind of a spring loaded little thing you put in there and they come in different sizes depending on, and you carry different sizes when you're climbing, depending on what kind of features you run into. So yeah, but you just put them in there and they open up kind of and will hold themselves in the place and you can clip your rope into that and then they'll hold your weight of like 200 pounds if you fall so <laughs> they're really crazy wow yeah that is crazy that's called trad climbing right mm -hmm. yep and then there's free climbing well yeah then there's the free climbing or actually free climbing is just um anything where you're not using what's called aid which is like these little hooks but then there's free soloing and so free soloing is kind of like what Alex Honnold did and what kind of a lot of people think rock climbing might be after that the movie came out. And stuff. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, oh, that's uh, how it, yeah. yeah, it's a pretty rare uh, subset of the community that actually does that. That is, it's more of that you're just so confident with your climbing skills that you're able to climb without any kind of safety equipment. Um, so it's like a pretty high level elite kind of head game for some of those people. But it's more like riding a bike with no brakes or something that, you know, not a lot of people are into, but like if you're confident in your bike handling skills, you can ride a bike with no brakes or something, but it's not really a common form of climbing. You Oh, you mean like fit with uh, like track racing and things like that is what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. Like right. a fixed gear bicycle. But yeah, exactly. It's like riding a track bike around or a fixie or something versus, you know, the normal cycling. <laughs> we like brakes. Brakes are cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because people say like sometimes be like, "Oh man, I could never do track racing because you know I need brakes." I'm like, "What? What do you mean? I got two brakes and I pat my thighs." I'm like, "I got two brakes right here." <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I had a race for a little bit. That was a fun experience getting to do this, the how to slow yourself down and do the skid stops and everything like that. So definitely something to learn there. Where'd you, where'd you learn that? And well, obviously not in New York, but where were you when you picked that up? Uh, just in Denver. I just had a little fixed gear to ride around town there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good skill. It's a, I think it's a useful skill 
to learn. I think there's outdoor skills that all human beings should learn. Uh, I think there's certain skills that we should all know how to do. Drive a stick shift. You know, you, there's a number of things, and that's one of them. Mm-hmm. Well, and what about bikes? Now, speaking of bikes, um, I, I wish I could. I could have asked. I, wish, I should have asked you for a picture of your giant Rincon <laughs> steel, like 1995 mountain yeah. bike, but. It impressed a lot of us on uh, in Colorado. Uh, <laughs> how about bike? <laughs> how did you get into, into cycling? This is where the good stuff comes in. Yeah, um, I guess I've always loved riding bikes and stuff. And growing up, I would just I had like a BMX bike, and then I'd ride my dad's like pretty much that old giant, <laughs> um, like a rigid mountain bike around. And there was some like little trails and you could ride down by the creek in Texas. So I would always do that. Um, and I always wanted a nicer bike. You know, I would like always look online and, and kind of shop around for them, but could never really afford them until after I graduated from college and I had a job. So after I got a couple actual paychecks, I bought a used mountain bike in Ohio and it was an old giant AC2. <laughs> <And> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, you're a giant lover too, huh? They just come, oh. come to you. <laughs> But I bought that bike and then ended up uh, transferring jobs out to Colorado. So then all of a sudden I had a mountain bike in Colorado and just started riding around. And there was tons of trails right next to where I worked. So started riding every day after work and became obsessed. Can can we – I really am curious about that right there, Colorado. And when you got there, you're, you're mentioning when you, you had first arrived in Colorado, right? Mm-hmm. Because, wow, Colorado is – heaven on earth i think yeah. um but how was that whole experience coming from where you were growing up in texas okay cool but now you're in colorado and where were you exactly uh in denver kind of and i worked in golden colorado where it's a lot of the mountain biking communities there so that was really helpful um but yeah honestly it was pretty much a whole new world for me of like the vert and the <laughs> challenging technical trails and like, you know, climbing thousands of feet on the bike and, uh, you know, just a lot more rocks and stuff than I was used to. But I was like, wow, this is like mountain biking. This is so cool. <laughs> and I just, really, yeah, no idea what I was doing at first. I didn't have a helmet when I first started riding. I was like just on flats in my running shoes and like didn't know to yield to the hikers and stuff. So I was like, not the, the best writer in my first month, but then I, I kind of learned and then became a good steward of the mountain bike community, I feel like, and really started exploring all the trails that Colorado has to offer. Which, uh, from what I've heard, is a lot, right? Yeah, there's a lot. I tried to just write everything, even in the, the front range of Denver, and it was it took me years. <laughs> so even if you live in a city, in the city like Denver, it's still easy. You can just get out of town and, and go riding. Yeah, there's not actually any riding in Denver itself. I mean, there's a bike path in South, but you do have to drive like 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, the Golden Area has lots of great riding. And then there's all the whole foothills and Boulder, um, Estes Park, Colorado Springs. And then you can drive up into the mountains just an hour and you have unlimited riding there too at higher elevations. So yeah, there's a ton of options. And, and how did you feel as you, like when you got into the community, what was that process like? Did you find it to be... Like, how was the process of getting into, well, because now it sounds like that, that you, because you're in this new space, you're able to really take advantage of mountain biking and, and, and thus uh, and get into a community. So, like, how was that, like, that process on many levels, just like in general, as people, as being uh, a black man in a space that, you know, is a place we are still working to uh, I don't want to say claim because that makes it sound like it wasn't or isn't ours, but you know what I mean, right? Like a space where we we can get to a point where we can recognize is also ours. So I know that's a lot, but h- how was all this? Yeah, I mean, I just was truly passionate about it. And I honestly rode by myself for a long time, which I think was fine because I could just develop my own skills at my own pace there. and. I like running by myself and that kind of thing. And like, you can go at your own speed when you're writing, 
Um, but then I kind of started to get lonely almost. And no, no one else I knew was really into mountain biking. <laughs> um, it, it seems like it's grown in popularity to me in the past, you know, six years or so. But um, mm -hmm. And I think the technology and the bikes getting better has also brought in more people since you're not dealing with the broken chains and flats as often and all that stuff. It's just a lot more. You have your bike and it works for the most part now. But yeah, it was a little bit hard. So I actually started joining these online groups and stuff and just trying to find other people to ride with and the community. Um, and yeah, that was a little bit hard at first, especially because a lot of people were kind of in their 60s and stuff that could even afford the mountain bikes, it seemed like at the time. Um, and, you know, they're going at a different, everyone's kind of riding at different paces. So it took me a little bit to find like a good mm -hmm. people, but I eventually had more friends that kind of bought bikes and saw how cool it was. And I helped a lot of, a lot of people buy their bikes too, because <laughs> I was kind of an expert. I've been fixing them and working on them and buying different bikes over the years. So like a lot of people came to me for advice and getting their first bike. And so that was really cool to help people get into the sport. Um, but yeah, there was not a whole lot of diversity, even riding that frequently. Uh, I remember this, my favorite trail system is Buffalo Creek in Colorado. And I was up there one weekend and I finally saw another black guy in the parking lot. And we were like joking, like, oh damn. Like, <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, he's just like, he's like, I thought you were, we were since, you must have got our days switched up. We're not straight into each other out here. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that moment is classic Alpha. Yeah. and we all have a story about that one you know like we're just like you make eye contact and say yeah <laughs> and there's that, that recognition you know what i'm saying yep. so that was pretty pretty interesting i guess for me and then after that i kind of was like well that's kind of weird that like it's been years now and i finally like just now ran into this other black mountain biker in like a major city and like a mecca for mountain biking you know what i mean so that kind of shows you um the diversity out there and so that's when i kind of started like um looking for other people online like i i know a lot of people have the same story but that's kind of where i ran to melbourne base camp and i found like the all mountain brothers page and i messaged tracy and stuff and um ended up meeting up with him and kind of forming more of that bipoc uh bike community so that was really cool too. So, uh, so how did you? So I, I'm going to assume this was all through Instagram. Uh, I'm finding all Mountain Brothers and uh, uh, and Melon and Basecamp. Danielle, how, how that was all? I would imagine that was through Instagram, though. Yeah, that was just through Instagram. I think I might have Googled some stuff too, but then it even took you back to Instagram or whatever. And like, there's those hashtags and everything like that. So yeah, I just kind of slowly started to see more and more people. So that was cool. That's amazing. That's exactly how I met like a lot of the. I, I think Aisha was the first one, and I remember I was looking at my phone. I was going in. I was like, you know what I mean? Yeah. The same moment you had, but I was on my screen. You were in real life, and the story <laughs> you just told, right? Yeah. But the feeling was the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know a lot of people hate on Instagram and social media, but I've really seen it as like this great thing because it can unite these communities together and you can find other people with similar interests and similar backgrounds and like kind of join forces with them and that really wasn't possible before so i think that sure social media has its downsides but the positives that have come out of it have been i think far greater oh yes for sure for sure i've met a lot of friends like we've met friends like yeah that were friends in real were the friend if it weren't for instagram then you and i would have never met back in october because i would have never met you know the whole chain of events right so yeah i totally agree with that um the internet's a tool right uh, the the i think the only setback with many of us in, in in various times is you know we forget that we're the user and it's the tool and not the other way around yeah yeah that's always good to keep in mind right it's like the internet instagram is really doing a good job if it can get you and me on our bikes or whatever together in real life then it's done its job the internet has done its job but if it's like all day <laughs> then it can, you know that's the other side of the sword you know yeah for sure of the blade um but hey i was i want to go back to this moment that you um that you mentioned where you saw that other black cyclist like when when you saw that did, did that affect you at all after like when you went home that night like the days following you were just like wow 
like how was that afterwards it was just like oh yeah cool did it make you actually reflect on on this whole thing with i don't know lack of diversity and and whatnot um yeah i mean it did kind of like i was saying make me like realize how maybe limited the diversity is in that the mountain bike world and so kind of made me start reaching out to other people and kind of taking proactive steps, I think. And I'm also pretty like an introverted person. And so it was like, maybe I should like get out of my shell a little bit and like try to interact and meet other people out there and stuff like that. Cause I also was like, Hey, it'd be cool to like ride with that guy, but I didn't get his number and I never saw him again. You know what I mean? So I was like, maybe I should, um, I don't know, just be more, active and extroverted in getting to know other people in the community so that was the kind of change that that had on me i would say good so so because of that you ended up becoming more social in real life i mean like yeah yeah, yeah. how'd you meet jalen that was was jalen uh a a, a a a product of this uh process um jalen adam like everyone yeah, no, Jalen, I met at Movement, the climbing gym in Denver. So that was really my home in Denver, the indoor climbing gym. Uh, I love it and my girlfriend loves it. So we're there like multiple times a week. And um, Jalen was there and he got a job there and worked at the front desk. So every time you're like checking in, you could like say hi to him and, you know, chat with him and stuff like that. So I really got to know him better and better. And then he would be in the gym all the time too, climbing. So he was a at a similar skill level also. So that's when you're climbing on the same level, it's really fun too, because you can like work on things together and, you know, help each other solve the problems in the in the gym. So that's how I got to know Jalen mainly. And then, I mean, I knew that he rode bikes and stuff, but he was mainly a climber to me. And then we kind of went for a few bike rides and then from there, the rest is kind of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. I actually am thinking about the climbing because, uh... When you what you were just saying about when you meet someone that's so at, at, at the similar skill level, obviously it's more fun because it's more dynamic. But uh, I, I don't climb personally, but I'm just curious. What and I'm imagining that this is true, but what do you think? What does what does climbing give you that transcends outside of climbing, like into into our day to day lives? Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. Actually, not even climbing but just sports in general of just i think climbing especially though is something that it really teaches you to work on yourself and to like notice the nuances and things and just to keep kind of pushing yourself and that like there is a reward like because you usually get to the top of the climb if you keep trying and it's one of those things where you like you keep trying that one climb over and over and like improve making small incremental improvements and then you eventually get it done, you know? And so I think that carries over into like your life a lot, you know, because if you start your morning, you do a long climb session and you're like, yeah, I got that one. And you go to the office and you carry that mindset over into like, hey, what can I make little improvements in today and keep getting better and better at? Then your whole life just starts to snowball and get better and better, I think. So improvement, but yeah. That's amazing. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, I, think I didn't have anything else. Yeah, no, I, I was just thinking about, like, as you're saying, like, wow, how easy or how how easy it could be to, like, to bring something like climbing, right, or sport, like you said, not to think, but just sport where you can get uh, a space, like movement gym, a space like that, movement climbing gym, and then just bring in kids and young people, e even adults, older people. I mean, adults are basically, I am a 42-year-old child. And I like learning new stuff and having fun and playing with my friends and stuff. So for people who otherwise would not have any access to activities like this, and I'm saying outside of cycling, because cycling, that's a whole nother conversation, right? Helmets, shoes, bikes, blah, blah, blah. But a local climbing gym or a local football field, right? Those things can really have uh, immediate effects on, 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 on individuals who otherwise would not have any uh, access to those activities. No? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what I think a lot of people are pushing for is that, um, like we want to diversify these sports, but also we just want like quality there and like for everyone to have that opportunity to just 
better themselves and learn about themselves and like keep improving. You know what I mean? Like that's not so much to ask for. Um, so yeah, it's just that it's really special and it's a gift and it's something that we just want everyone to have. Right. And I like what you said, how you mentioned that. What's the difference for you between diversifying sports and then increasing the quality for more people? How do, how do each of those look for you? Diversity talks about numbers. But I don't know. We need more than that, don't you think? Yeah. In the outdoor so. spaces, I'm speaking, right? Cycling, climbing, everything, all of this. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you add diversity, you just add value for the most part, which we've seen over and over in history of different people coming into the sport and their take on it and uh, what they can offer and what they bring and their personalities and all that stuff is just more variety. It usually turns out better, you know what I mean? So I don't really see any argument against it. So yeah, it'd be really great to see more companies making quality, affordable gear for more people to get into the sports and maybe not pushing the highest end products all the time. And hey, we're focused on this new thing and it's like, it's 30 bucks and it does the job and it'll get you out there or something, you know, so. Right, are, are you, just add, are you working with, um, are there any, like what groups are really doing this well in, in, in your area? And I guess Colorado too, because you've been, some time there, so I assume you know who are really um, who are really doing a good job with um, increasing diversity and inclusion in these sports. Anyone that you can think of, like off the bat, like who's doing an awesome job? You had to pick like the top three. Like these people or groups, individuals or groups are doing top notch job for this. Um, yeah, that's hard to say. I mean, honestly, it's been one of my favorite things has just been seeing so many people be proactive and take part in these different organizations or even start their own organizations, essentially. I mean, when you look at what Tracy did with All Mountain Brothers, he just started something, you know, and that's what's also cool in this day and age is you can kind of start a Kickstarter or GoFundMe or just create a meetup group online and people will show up and you start building that community slowly. So honestly, there's too many to list, but you know, I mean, even at movement, there was a night where I think during this same month for black history month, you know, uh, outdoor Afro and black girls or Brown girls climb came out. And so that was really cool to see what they were working on um, and just bringing the community together. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. I'm yeah. I, personally, where I, because I'm in Spain, um, and in Spain we don't really have anything like this. I think that this problem is still there. There's definitely the lack of diversity and inclusion in all of these spaces. It's completely apparent. But I don't know. It's weird, and, and it's like it's just not that much of an of an issue here. And to me, I think that's what makes it worse because it makes it like a hidden thing that no one at least like i think stateside people are talking about it doing actions and bringing communities together whereas here it's crazy because we have some of the best climbing and riding and, and mountain biking everything out here in in northeast uh spain but when i hit when i go out to the trails to run or if i go out and i'm riding it's the same thing i don't really there's really no there's very little diversity like right now, I am the diversity in my town. <laughs> Still. And one other person. So. Yeah, I've never, do, I don't know. Country, but I've always been interested to travel around a little bit and just see how life is in different parts of the world and what that looks like. So it's cool to hear your take on that. I got to get my passport, Marty. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've I've been seeing as soon as listen as soon as the the vaccines and everything everything is and people are vaccinated, everyone wants to travel. The companies want to get people. Everyone wants to get back to to a normal life. So as soon as that happens, um, we have to plan something for all you guys to come out here. You know. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and and, and like, so one more quick thing I wanted to ask you is. Um, what types of activities are, I don't know, how do you see actions for our listeners 
uh, or viewers uh, for yourself, uh, what types of actions can you or myself or someone who's thinking, wow, um, man, that, you know, I have this, what can, what can an individual do you think to, I don't know, get this little community started? Obviously we have technology, but like technology aside, um, what can we do? Like, I'm asking you, I'm asking me like to get more of us out here uh, quickly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I don't know. It's an open question. I'm, I'm act also asking myself, <laughs> what yeah. would you do if you were the all seeing God of outdoor activities? Like, what would you say? Hmm, like these are the things that need to happen in order to have a complete, like to have the outdoors look like the, the, the distribution of the way people are actually of, of our actual population. Right. Because there's a skew in that. Right. When you do sports, we don't see a reflection of what our population actually looks like. You know what I mean? So I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Um, Big question. I guess how I've always um, tackled that is through my photography. You know, I try to like share those places and show people the beauty and like the experiences that are out there. And so I've kind of always just hoped that maybe my photos, uh, you know, maybe that's my contribution to helping mm -hmm. show people like, hey, I'm black, I'm out here, it's really cool, you know what I mean? I'm having a great time, and these are the sites out here, like this is the peak, it's beautiful, maybe you wanna check it out yourself, and so that can mm -hmm. kind of encourage people, because when you say, hey, you should go for a hike, that's kind of like, but why? You know, I can play video games or do whatever else, but when you're like, hey, there's this beautiful crystal clear lake with like a snow-capped peak on it, and it's like only a mile and a half to get there, you should give it a try, and then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I saw that picture. I want to go there and check that out, you know. So I guess that's kind of been my my direction. But also just those, it's hard with corona, obviously, but sometimes those real-world interactions and just that one-on-one -on -one of just seeing someone who's like, hey, are you interested in this or do you want to give it a try? I saw that you like kind of were asking me some questions about this. Like, I'll take you climbing next week or something like that. And there's just being an actual person there to help support and provide some some guidance or some just cheerleading really is. Mm -hmm. right. Do and and have you uh, and and from your photography because well for all of our viewers um, you can check out uh, Evan at the Green Evan on Instagram. His feed is amazing. I love it. Have you heard? Uh, do you get feedback from people like, oh wow, like man, I, I never knew like. Or people will message you, do you like, man, I didn't even know that any of this even existed. Or like, did you get what kind of feedback have you heard from people for this? Yeah, I have. And especially even after moving down to New Mexico and I'm kind of like new here, man, I'm like so stoked on all the you know outdoor activities here and I've been exploring stuff and posting pictures of it. And I've had a lot of people message me and be like, I had no idea like all this was in my state, even, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, there's tons of stuff out there, right? You know, 10 minutes from town, and it's really cool. And you should probably check it out. I think people, um, I, I mean, I felt this way myself, but sometimes when you're not in Colorado or like, you're like, I'm not in the Alps or something, you know what I mean? Like, I can't, I'm not a rock climber, but even Tennessee and stuff, there's like lots of great climbing and the, all these other places around the US. And like, if you look for it, it it's there, you know? So yeah, just kind of mm -hmm. showing, appreciating your own backyard. And Corona has also been kind of cool for that. It just, um, making the outdoors. I mean, I love just like, I went for a run around the little park this morning and then uh, just hanging out in your backyard too is always cool. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and personally myself, uh, you know, getting into something like cycling or I got into cycling through running and I can see that cycling and meet, through meeting you and Adam and Jalen and all of the Fox, everyone that, that it's uh yeah it's literally about community and opening up these new worlds like uh the split boarding you know i want to try that now yeah you know i i never knew you know what i mean and like now i've, I've got the I've, I've, i can see like wow that sounds that sounds pretty awesome i think i'd like to try that so man if finding a way that we can if we could recreate this feeling in mass you know what i mean then that'll be great but i don't know i think that for now we can be happy with uh with what um uh, Instagram and social media has brought us, ironically, what, what COVID has brought us. 
you know, I'm, uh, you can't find bikes. I'm sure that there's a lot of outdoor equipment we can't find out because of this. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And personally, I'd like to think that things are better today than they were five, ten years ago, as far as diversity and inclusion. I'd like to think that things are better now. It's a lot of work to go. Yeah, I mean, I in the way I see it, things have been improving, and if we look at the track record of the U.S., like there have been huge improvements over time in like equality and justice. And are we done? No, but I do think we need to stop sometimes and recognize that you know things are on the up, you know, and like to kind of not be so down all the time and realize that yeah, we still have some work to do. But I feel like we're making the refinements now of more the work that was kind of done through the civil rights era versus um, kind of those big, you know, ending segregation is a huge thing. And now it's a, a much more smaller nuanced thing that we really, it's almost harder work because we can't quite, you know, yeah. a, a one big law that we're trying to change. It's such a nuanced thing in society that's so systematic and it's almost more difficult than trying to change just that one <laughs> law is the task that we have in front of it us. Is. But, you know, it's what we need to work on and keep working on and striving towards. So good. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I think that's a good way to, to kind of, to cap off. Um, I, I agree. I think that sometimes we need to pause and like for the ones of us who are putting in the work to, to create this uh, more inclusive space, you know, it can be kind of daunting, you know, but it's, you know, every once in a while we need to stop and, and, and give ourselves a little bit of credit um, for the, for what progress has been made, right? Yeah, exactly. I feel like that's important. Just a little breather, just a break. We're not off work. We're just taking, it's just like, you know, let's just take a little you know, coffee break and just appreciate what what has, has come to pass on the positive side, and then we get back to work. For sure. Anyway, listen, I, I really, I really appreciate you uh, coming on to, to speak with us, uh, Evan. Um, I kind of got all this put together. We put this all together like super last minute, but um, I'm very happy uh, that we had a chance to chat and that uh, we got a chance to get to know each other a little bit better. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to having you and all the foxes and more out here in Spain. Um, Anything you'd like to cap off? Anything you'd like to say to your your viewers and your fans out there before we take off, Evan? Um, no, just want to say thanks for having me on and doing this little interview. It's really cool, and yeah, I can't wait to see you again, Marty. You were, I, you know, it's always so hard when you only know people like through a digital thing, and then meeting you in person, you were like so much more lively and like crazy and fun and like did i have ever ever expected so i was like wow yeah <laughs> now i'm like yeah if I get to be like, are you just gonna be there at the airport waiting to pick me up you know what i mean and like so it's it's yeah cool to have made that friendship and it's awesome thank you man it is man it was great i'm glad it was it, i i had like I had such a good vibe like to have been to have met met on instagram and then we meet we meet in real life it's been uh october was really really a touching month and um yeah, we'll be creating more of this. Hopefully the more of the people that see this kind of community being built right here are inspired, can get inspired and like start doing their own little thing and like their own little pockets. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what I think is important too. It can be kind of those small actions just set up that chain reaction, you know, and that's all that it takes. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like a tipping point. I think we're, we're kind of getting, we're kind of getting, we're, we're on our way there. But one last thing before we go, can you tell our viewers um, where they can find you on social media and how they can support your work, if at all? Yeah, um, I'm at the Green Evan on Instagram. I have a website, uh, www.greenevan.com, um, and you can I sell some prints on there. And uh, also, I feel like these days, I think one of the best things you can do to support kind of the photographers and the creatives is to buy a magazine subscription because a lot of the magazines are struggling, but that's still like where the professional photographers and the writers and the storytellers of today are. And, you know, a lot of people are just scrolling so much that those print based, you know, real professional journalism kind of pieces are going away and it's really sad. So maybe consider getting a bicycling magazine subscription or something, you know, so 
that always helps. Really? That is so interesting. I'm known for the cap this off, but that's such an interesting point because that's something that someone, so many of us probably don't even think about. Not even, we don't even, it's one thing not to know something. We don't know that we don't know that. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't really something I had realized so much either until I got more into the freelance world. And I was like, wow, the magazines all need consistent photos and they're all asking for stories and like they're paying rates and stuff like that. So it's kind of like when you buy that subscription, you're kind of crowdfunding this whole bigger thing. So yeah, don't get in that to your subscription. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to magazines, everyone. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. Thanks. Um, okay, so anyway. Um, that'll be all for uh, today's episode of Black Present History in the Making. I want to thank all of you for coming out and watching. And uh, you know where you can find Evan and how you can support uh, uh, work like his. And uh, if you want to find out more about the Black Foxes, come and visit us at www.theblackfoxes.com. Once again, Evan, thanks so much. And we will be in touch, my friend. Definitely. Thanks again, Marty. All right, man. Talk soon. See ya.